Thank you for having me here today. The title of my presentation is Naked Days of Future Past, Revisiting the X-Men in the Context of Exhibitionist Erotic Humiliation. The traditional reading of nudity in general, in comics, operates through an asymmetric perspective that sees nudity as a spectacle, or even an object, within a transaction by which the reader consumes said spectacle for the sake of erotic gratification. The simple underlying principle, and obvious generalization, has absolutely dominated the way that states of undress are discussed within North American comic scholarship, due to a complex coalescence of comics apologism, protectionist reading practices of sexual representation, in the terminology of Jennifer C. Nash, and quite frankly a simplistic perception of how human sexuality works. Despite its much-discussed flaws and limitations, the male gaze theory has become the dominant approach to sexuality in comics, and that is a tragic misconstrual for a medium that has a truly compelling and uniquely dynamic perspective to offer on human sexuality. The alternative has often been to read erotic scenes outside of any erotic context, in order to disentangle them from the implications of the male gaze, but in doing so, scholars often, but by no means always, decontextualize or recontextualize the works, an unappealing option. Where theories on comics eroticism tend to read characters in various states of undress as strictly the subjects of an objectifying gaze, it is also possible to locate the erotic instead within character identification. So instead of approaching the undressed character as an offer, in the language of Cress and Van Leeuwen, we preserve the reader's embodiment of the character and read the undress as a part of the embodiment fantasy. This can be seen in the context of what is referred to as exhibitionist erotic humiliation, a common kink that sees individuals deriving sexual pleasure from being publicly exposed. So two key pieces here, exhibitionism and humiliation. Exhibitionism is quite common. In a 2014 study of kink behaviors with a sample of almost 1,600 participants, Jennifer Eve Rehor found that more than half of the survey sample indicated that they participated in at least one of the five categories of exhibitionistic behavior, erotic pleasure from being observed, listed in the survey. The majority of the subsample enjoyed showing bare breasts, followed by engaging in public sex, being naked, acting out sexual fantasy slash roleplay, and showing genitals. More than half of the participants indicated that they posed for erotic images, and or that they shared erotic images of themselves with others for their own sensual or erotic pleasure. EEH is a specific subset of exhibitionism that connects the kink to masochism, famously the M in BDSM. According to famed social psychologist Ro Boymeister, quote, masochism involves a desire for an enjoyment of sexual experiences involving pain, loss of control, and humiliation. In terms of purpose slash function, Bollmeister concludes that masochism fosters an escape from the stressful awareness of one's ordinary identity. In this sense, it is an escapist sexual practice, which makes it ideal for representation in visual media such as comics, and perhaps even especially ideal for superhero comics, which are widely associated with escapist fantasy. So we put the exhibitionism and the masochism together, and we get EEH. As Brett Lunsford notes in The Real Consequences of Imaginary Sex Acts, for some, the humiliation during a sexual encounter can provide a significant erotic charge. The reasons for this are complex, but as Lunsford notes, not hard to see in a modern context. Everything from undressing in front of a partner, to wearing revealing undergarments, to exchanging naked photos, erotic exposure is already woven into a lot of human sexual behaviors, and can be associated with things like trust, vulnerability, and intimacy. And so an act of exposure in a comic holds the potential to trigger associations with common sexual practices. Before we go about locating this, however, a disclaimer. The study of the male gaze in comics is important, maybe the most important project we could possibly undertake when it comes to sexuality in comics, but it isn't universal, and therein lies the rub. Entendre intended, because we keep perceiving undress in comics as what Scott Bukatman terms simple adolescent masturbatory fantasy, and it can be that, it can often be that. This is an important piece of comics history. But if drawings of naked people with hilarious proportions are all that's required for this industry to succeed, we'd all be millionaires. Eroticism is exactly as complicated as human sexuality is complicated, and the fetishizing and dehumanizing practices associated with the male gaze are not the only thing sexy about comics art. In her introduction to Supersex, Dr. Anna Papard acknowledges the obvious in noting that by wearing their underwear on the outside and proudly displaying their exaggeratedly hard and sensuous curves inside revealing skin-tight costumes, virtually all the most famous superheroes openly invite erotic possibilities. 
But Papard also acknowledges what she refers to as a superhero's ability to simultaneously show and hide potentially deviant sexualities, and specifically isolates this as an important aspect of the genre's endurance and longevity. So what else makes comics sexy? I can't answer that, but I can perhaps show one other option through EEH in the works of one specific writer, Chris Claremont, a comics writer whose work I've been studying for a great many years now. For anyone unfamiliar, Claremont wrote Uncanny X-Men for 16 years, beginning in 1975. His work is progressive beyond measure, and is credited with featuring the first African-American team leader, the first woman team leader, the first canonically Jewish superhero, the first interracial kiss between two Marvel superheroes, uh, and for being what Richard Reynolds calls a superhero comic of choice among the LGBT community. It's also famous for incorporating a whole lot of kink woven into a superhero soap opera of the highest order. As noted in a 2020 article by Ian Gregory for Comics XF, Claremont's tendencies have become so well known, fans have openly questioned his kinks for years, and there's even a decidedly kink-shaming blog dedicated to every instance of mind control in Claremont's work. There is no doubt that Claremont was aware of the kink implications of his stories. His notes for the Hellfire Club explicitly say that kink is allowed, but only to a point. Tangentially related, Cracked.com has termed my own project the kinkiest deep dive. Obviously, it would be unprofessional for me to be deeply proud of that title, so any inflection of glee you might think you hear in my voice is purely your imagination. So where do we see this EEH in Claremont's work, and how might the construction of the scenes, texts, and images invite the EEH gaze? Let's take a quick overview of some examples before narrowing in. In UXM 169, Nightcrawler is having an intimate bath with his girlfriend when an emergency necessitates fast heroism. As such, he is forced to go outside in the nude amidst the New York City skyline to perform a daring rescue. In UXM 197, Colossus blocks an incoming missile at the expense of his costume. He is then seen struggling to cover himself up while Kitty Pride torments him about the embarrassing exposure. In UXM 205, Wolverine is attacked off-page by a group of cyborg assassins and must therefore spend the entire issue fighting internal and external demons in only his briefs and one boot. His exposure emphasized by the contrast with the Blizzard backdrop. In UXM 236, Wolverine and Rogue are teleported to the island of Genosha. Their clothes are not, and so they have an extended fight sequence in the buff. Despite the nudity, the scenery emphasizes power fantasy with both characters violently wrecking a group of generic soldiers. In New Mutants 21, Cannonball is called into action due to an alien attack. Clad only in a towel, he must fight the invader, while his thought bubble calls attention to his state of undress. This is by no means a comprehensive sample. These scenes are fairly frequent in their recurrence and fairly diverse in their specific presentations, but as you can see, they involve both male and female characters and tend to function around acts of heroism on the part of the protagonist, not around a secondary character who is fetishized by their sexual attributes to connote what Mulvey terms to be looked at -ness. Now, we could still read sex objects in these scenes, but we could also read erotically charged, in Lunsford terms, reader surrogates, or anything in between, or even multiple forms of erotic gaze operating simultaneously in variations that are subjective to the perspective of individual audience members. But given the compelling academic emphasis on both Claremont's incorporation of BDSM symbols and the general queerness of Claremont's X-Men in particular, we definitely need a more complex and multifaceted sexology to account for the full sexual subtext of his work. But let's narrow things down even further. Arguably the best resource for a consistent, sustained engagement with EEH might be in the X-Men spin-off series Excalibur, a series that partially distinguishes itself from other X-Titles through the integration of elements of sex farce, an integration that tends to bring the kink out of the subtext and into the foreground a bit more. The EEH theme is established quite clearly. Issue 1 of Excalibur features a scene in which a beautiful woman casually intrudes upon Nightcrawler while he is naked in the bath. The scene is from his perspective, providing his internal monologue, which emphasizes his shock and embarrassment. In terms of macrosemiotic context, the scene is there, in large part, to establish what will become Excalibur's main love triangle. Issue 2 will then feature another scene of accidental nudity, in which Kitty Pride heroically emerges from inside the extra-dimensional creature that had consumed her, and she is nude. 
Now, I do want to note here that Kitty is a nebulously underage character, but there are ways in which a reading of an EEH gaze as opposed to a male gaze offer a slightly less sketchy interpretation of the sexualization of a child. I'm not sure I'll have time to get into that fully, but maybe in the discussions we can. I'm not supporting the portrayal of naked underage characters. In fact, I'm quite happy to come out against that practice and say, maybe don't. Uh, but that's what we have to work with here, and I didn't want to ignore a prominent example just for being problematic. The masochist connection gets dragged to the foreground in the Inferno crossover, a crossover that specifically engages with the idea of surfacing sexual hits, uh, which we see in Excalibur number six and number seven, where the character Megan transforms into a dominatrix version of herself called the Goblin Princess in order to hold Brian in very skimpy leather gear on a leash in a state of complete domination slash subordination to accompany the exhibitionism. In the following issue, Brian has a notable wardrobe malfunction in a scene that emphasizes his sense of shame, most prominently through a panel featuring a mother gasping in astonishment while her child openly points at Brian's nudity, while a police officer turns his head embarrassed, saying only, oh boy. The next panel shows Brian becoming suddenly aware of his undress, with a background caption synesthetically rendering the word blush. We see something similar in Excalibur 11. The undress starts when Kitty Pride, again an underage character, in frustration explosively phases out of her borrowed clothing. At this exact instant, she is teleported to an alternate dimension audience chamber rendered in a long horizontal panel that emphasizes the scope of that chamber and the sheer size of the audience inhabiting it. As the page turns, the audience's attention turns as well to the naked intruder in their world in a dynamic bit of draftsmanship that centers Kitty within four panels worth of attentive gaze. Somehow unaware of her nudity, she reaches out to make first contact, only to teleport back to her home dimension in the most embarrassing way possible, to appear naked in front of a man she holds a crush on, alongside the woman that she sees as her romantic rival. The entire four-panel sequence along the bottom row cultivates Kitty's sense of embarrassment, highlights of which include a red color shade panel with the word blush again, rendered textually but also evident in the coloring of her face, Kitty wishing for death, uh, and Rachel establishing that the event will have to be treated henceforth as if it never happened. Importantly, the entire spectacle is framed through Kitty's viewpoint. The viewers of Kitty's embarrassment are never narrativized, at least not while she's present. There is no ideal ego to justify the male gaze, just Kitty, naked and humiliated just as Brian was in issue 8. As we see in these scenes, the physically idealized bodies in a state of undress are here, but the essential mechanics of the male gaze, as articulated by Laura Mulvey, are not. Mulvey suggests that the male gaze in comics works through a combination of dehumanization through fetishism and the intrusion of the audience into the subject's private space. Only one of those things is happening, and not quite in the way Mulvey intended. The intrusion is there, but the, under but the undressed character is conscious of it, even hyper-aware of it. And as Claremont's work famously emphasizes character agency and sexual agency in particular, the dehumanization slash fetishization is likewise difficult to locate. Malvi also suggests that a reader surrogate character will inhabit the scene in order to justify the male gaze. That's not here either. The undressed character is the viewpoint character. All of this is transpiring, by the way, in just one year of Excalibur comics, and I've barely touched on all the possible examples that we might speak to in that series alone. As all of these scenes suggest, Claremont recurrently incorporates themes of erotic exhibitionist humiliation in his stories, thus demonstrating just one manner by which kink can manifest in comics in such a way as to complicate the traditional readings of the male gaze. That's still here too, I think, but accounting for rhetorical appeals to the erotic in these comics, and to comics in general, requires a more complex and sophisticated sexology capable of drawing out the intersecting erotic appeals inhabiting the page. And this one particular kink, if nothing else, can show us that the male gaze is not the only gaze with which to approach such a project. Thank you.